Okay, it's recording. So thank you for coming to the dissertation, our journey session with me, Antonia. I was going to have some friends, but unfortunately, um, they couldn't make it for whatever reason they, you know, they have. So this is a short-ish, long-ish, however, however long it's going to be, depending on the questions um, we have at the end. But um, yeah, so this, yeah, I'm very glad that you were able to make it. And um, yes, let's begin. So yes, this, today is the 18th of July, 2020. And uh, about a little bit about me. So my name is Antonia Disler. I'm a single parent of two. Uh, I'm the founder of Uni Squad, which is a student support group uh, for all levels and different degrees. I've been student representative since level five and level six. And it seems like I'm still doing that role, even though I'm about to become a graduate. <laughs> um, also a fundraiser, a volunteer. I've raised money in the name of Unisquad to uh, for Richard House Children Hospice, uh, which is a ch uh, children hospice based in Beckton and many other branches around the UK. Um, so that was such a, a, a great honour to do. Um, we had free events, so um, yeah, that's, I, I really urge people to just venture in and look into um, hospices because they're really underrated. I'm also a new YouTuber, uh, vlogging about academic life, um, this and that really, just starting out and see how that takes me, and, um, and aiming to specialise in multimodality in schools and communal resources to empower um, families and children to become knowledgeable in different modes, because I understand that a lot of families may not have access to the internet, um, may not have access to resources for whatever reason, and if we make society multimodal, then there will be there will be a chance that we can bridge the gap between the advantage and disadvantage, and um, uh, gender gaps as well as age gaps as well through technology and um, traditional norms. So that's a little bit about myself. So the challenges of choosing my dissertation topic. So. I had too many ideas floating on my mind and floating on paper. And when you have so many passions, it's kind of hard to decipher which one you want to do. Um, so that was quite a, a big challenge for me. Um, trying my best to be original, because uh, I was obviously sitting in a, in a group of people and everyone's like, shouting at different ideas or just scribbling it down. And you don't want to be a carbon copy, copy um, student. You want everything to be original um a lot of ideas was coming about um children and play um how children read um all, all the sort of things like that which is overread overdone and i thought let's just try to do something different but i didn't know the terminology of what i wanted to do so that's hence um you know my options in the courses came along and i chose multimodality uh, trying to choose the best topic that you're most passionate about, that was hard. Because when you never had to sit down before and look at which is, you know, what area in your life or something that you read about or, or learnt about is more um, interesting to you, it's quite hard to decipher which is the most prominent for you that you want to venture into career-wise or even down to dissertation in, in this respect. So that was a challenge for me to, to categorise which is the most important or interesting ones for me. Finding relevant reading to suit your chosen topic, that was difficult because I had a, a, a plan to do something about medicine and about medical areas in children and I couldn't find any reading to do with that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to hit roadblocks. If I'm hitting with them now, I'm going to hit a series of roadblocks in the future. So I don't think that topic is the best one to get into. So I scrapped that one, which is the best thing I've done actually. Um, so this is a top tip. If you've chosen a topic and you can't find reading out there, um, be mindful. You're going to hit walls, big walls um, down the line. And you don't have the time to keep searching and searching and searching. You end up probably making stuff up, uh, which is not ethical, or you just literally be very limited. And then you might say, you might be told that you haven't done enough wide reading and there's none out there to begin with. So be mindful on the topic that you choose, that you're going to choose through the reading or the amount of literature that's out there. 
Um, yes, and obviously worried about ethics. Ethics is a big thing. You get it wrong, then that is it. Um, you can you can get something that may seem so minor, um, even down to your behaviour, um, your conduct, or um, forgetting to to for one of your participants to fill out the consent form, but going ahead with the interview. These things you have to stick stick with the script. You have to know it through. Uh, like the back of your hand you have to almost memorize or you have to memorize your script of ethics before you even get into that um the setting and uh, also the um the safeguarding um policies of the setting that you're getting into you have to uh, abide by that as well including the ethics standards that you sign and sworn that you're going to adhere to in the university so you have to maintain that you're representing the university when you go to your setting whichever it is as well as you're respecting the settings um, policies in safeguarding. So that's what I was worried about. Can I do this? You know, um, but I managed to, and so can you. And then I think as I put the feeling lost, that was the main challenge I had. I didn't know how to get out of it because um, I had too many topics, as, as I stated earlier. I didn't know which one it was, um, was the most passionate I, I could do, the one that was most interesting. I felt like I was kind of delaying myself in time. We keep thinking about what topic I'm going to do. Is it going to give me a first? Is it this? Is it that? Listening to my peers, uh, feeling that I'm not at that level yet, which I should have been. So I learned how to breathe. I learned how to relax. That's the biggest thing that I have issues with. I still have that today. Um, just to remember to just pause and breathe. Take your time with it. And um, even though, like I said, the time is crunching, but once you learn how to just, just stop for a moment, just let it sit for a day, come back to it, you might see things in a better and different perspective. And that's what I learned how to do. So it's a simple technique that we take for granted every day. Just breathe. So uh, now, what did I, what, you know, what I did to choose my dissertation? So um, I did a series of things that I learned to do obviously from the lectures um from the the seminars the workshops i learned how to do these things and plus the re readings of um uh, self-help books as well which the lectures will sh or lecturers should sh will show you or uh, you can actually just go on google and um, google books and research them or your university library at uel for example so i categorized my topics numbering them from one to five in order of preference I tried to find for finding interesting readings for each one, fizzled out which ones I was struggling with, as stated before. Finally, I got to my top three, which was a journey and a half. But I got there. And um, yeah, I spoke to with my classmates and friends during sessions about each one. That is important. Sometimes I feel like, oh, someone might take my idea or whatever, but it's kind of nice to if you're in a safe space and you feel like this is the area which they do, the lecturers do try to make it um, very uh, a safe area where what's discussed in the lecture in the room should not be discussed elsewhere. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So, so you're able to talk to people because everybody's in that same mindset. Everyone knows not to discuss what's been said in the room. So that's what I did. I spoke with the classmates um, and friends in sessions about each one. And ultimately, I followed my instinct, instinct and the one I enjoyed researching and reading about the most. So that's the one I stuck with. So my first story. So yeah, then it hit me. I have um, three other assignments to do. I have so little time. It's not like I had... Um, you know, separate like a separate whole month for my dissertation, and I had the other assignments in a, in one other month or whatever. I had to do all of this load of work, which it was. A dissertation is not a simple thing to do. They had different stages, different forms to fill in, different workshops, different this, different that, plus the lectures you have to go through to go to with the other modules. Um, the reading, the writing, the checking of the drafts from all the other ones you have to do. So it was not easy. But 
you know, I, at the same time, that, that I started uni life and whatever, I was a mum, I'm still a mum, um, I still had other things and priorities to do, and you only got certain hours, 24 hours in, in a day, so how can you fit all that in? That I, I just literally thought to myself, I'm not this kind of person, I can't be this person who manages everything at one time. Um, I had to kind of prioritise the time, and utilise my time in certain ways and learn how to adapt. And I think that's what frazzles um, people a lot when it comes to managing dissertation, managing a, a other modules, managing home life, is because you need to break it down. You do need to break it down. Don't think you can just jump into it and then think you can just cope one time. And that's how people have breakdowns. That's how people fail. That's how people just literally just look at their work and say, I can't do this because it's too much. You need to read this categorize everything in their time in their place and assign it to a certain time so this is why i created this so i got myself organized and i made a um a assignment planner so this is what i've been using from the start of when i started my um degree so this was in the second term i just made this up so i got my modules my assignments the deadline uh, complete if it's completed or not, the real deadline and the grade. So when it comes, hey, my future, what's your deadline? I made my own deadline even before the milestones that um, the, the dissertation model lecturer set. So I made my own deadline and I used this, te this template for all of my um, assignments, including my dissertation. So that's how I got on top of it. So I had, for example, ED6014, um, and it was going to be set, the deadline was set, set on one day and all the other ones had different um, deadlines but very close to each other. So I said, Antonio, you know what you're going to do? You're going to set a day where it's going to be due. Then when it's close to that time, so from when you set that deadline to the actual deadline, you have that cooling off period. That cooling off period, I made it to be the time where I look over my work. Uh, I look through all the stuff that um, could be missed or overlooked and stuff. So you give yourself time. You give yourself time, that breathing time to literally say, okay, I've done it. It's done. Um, I don't have to run to get it done last minute, but I've done it at so, at so time and I have time to do the rest of the work that I have to do. And um, this formula worked. It had, it, it worked. It got me through the, the final year. It got me through level four, five, and six. No, no, and I will not drop it for when I do my masters as well because it's going to be much harder. You know, more work count for this for the actual dissertation for masters. So I'm definitely carrying this on, and yet yeah, the link will be made available in the chat somewhere. So I'll go pop it up um, afterwards. So yeah, so I started thinking of my settings very early. Um, when I couldn't decide what topic I was going to do, I had to start thinking, right, okay, so what's feasible? You know, what if I was going to do the assignment or whatever I'm going to do, where am I going to have the setting? So I started um, deciding what area I want to get into, as in the place, and that helped me decide exactly what topic. Like concrete, I'm doing this topic, I'm going to go in this setting, and I'm going to go with this year group, um, this age group, and that helps me. So once you get all these checklists done, it does help you decide better, a lot better, in the area and the field that you want to get to for your dissertation. Because it, it's like a jigsaw. You have to fit it in nicely. Otherwise, when the, the person marks, um, who's reading your work looks at it, it's just like you didn't plan it well, or you just rushed it, you just threw it together, handed it in, there was not much care. It's a, it's a tailoring process. So it's worth taking the time to just literally decide the setting, the age group, um, the, the year group, you know, because there's a lot, some, some ages um, can overlap into different year groups as well. So you've got to think, if I'm doing pre-stage one and there's some children who are um, just turning four late, but in, in your, no, sorry, turning, turning uh, five late, but and there's some children that's six years old. Am I going to target the six year old children only or the five year old? All these sort of things you have to start thinking about. So it's down to the detail. Just, just take your time with that. So 
what I did, um, what, so what did I want to find out? So I wanted to find out so what interests me, what was missing out of the chosen topic. I decided to focus on my dissertation. Um, and with that, it allowed me to unlock all the stuff that I wanted to, to find out which, um, and piece together, which was my research question. Most important, your positionality. Where do you stand in this research? You know, what's, what's your viewpoint? But remember to stay um, um, unbiased, objective, but you have to really acknowledge in your dissertation your positionality and how that's not going to affect your, um, your conclusion as well as the perception from the other the sample um, perspectives that can't sway um, the results. So as you have to really decipher what or where you're standing in this, interpretivist, you know, all that. So that's a really important. In your research paradigm, the framework, all that comes together once you start deciding on the topic and everything else. Um, the more you read, the better your your interest is into your um, your dissertation and the more interesting your research becomes because if you're doing it half-heartedly well like you know what I, I, this is kind of boring and you start writing up it will reflect in that when the person is reading your work it will just show that you didn't just care you just started it's like a summary or just a, a, a descriptive piece of work you, if you're really passionate about it it will just kind of ooze out of your dissertation you know so the more you read, the more interested you get into it, the more interesting your, your dissertation is. And the more interesting the, the topic, the better. Trust me when it comes to your mark. So this, as you can see here, is my actual <clears throat> diary, which I documented all my thoughts and plans. And I'm sure um, your uh, lecturer at the level five would have told you all about diary, 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 write the diary, this, that, and the other. Literally, I got it right here. This is my diary, full of scraps. All my thoughts, everything is in here. And it's so important to write a diary. I mean, the days when it's challenging, the days when it's great, the days when you feel like you just felt blank, all the things, all the causes to why you had a great day, the, day, the, the days you felt blank, the days you felt like, you know what, I don't have a clue what's going on always write the build up to why you're feeling that because when it comes to the point of your reflection in your dissertation you've got everything to write because that's the part where you have to write down your diary part so if you don't have you if you haven't documented all these things you're gonna come out short when it comes to that part you always have to reflect your journey throughout your research process is vital and it makes you a better researcher as well you know you can see the parts where you could have improved on um so all that is is worth is worth noting okay i've got 10 minutes so i've got to go, go through this quickly uh, so research strategy must do so getting the consent forms um of the setting and gatekeeper and uh, getting the consent from of all the participants and samples that's a must do that. If you don't, then you're in big trouble. Do that. Get that right first time. There's no, don't let, don't let um, uh, whosoever email you to say, oh, sorry, but this wasn't signed properly or not dated. Get it done quickly, fast, done. Nip it the bug. semi structured interviews. I practice in my family, so I chose that, what I wanted to do. Sat in front of the mirror to practice my body language, brush up on and looking and sounding professional. And with confidence, because once you ease of confidence, not um, being, you know, obnoxious and whatever, that's that's the wrong kind of vibe or know it all. You're there, you have to present yourself as a learner. When you're there researching, you must look, feel, sound, you're there to learn, not there to the person that knows everything and I'm testing your knowledge. Never do that because it will reflect on you, trust me. Um, Practice note taking during interviews. I've done that. You know, writing, looking up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, I found it hard to do that. But when I started practicing at home, it was a lot better. I was like, I'm paying attention to you as I'm talking to you, you know? Um, played around with my new equipment, my dictaphone. I played around with it because never get something out of a package from Amazon or whatever to, to record the interview. You don't try it. And then on the day you think, okay, it's simple. I'll just put it on, it's going to work. Sometimes it might be faulty. 
So just try your equipment before you get to the place. And most of all, keep to the strict of your approved ethics form. Keep to the script. Because if you don't, again, that's a red flag. You probably fail. You don't want that. So I type, type, type. I typed up all my um, my interviews word for word. Do not do not change any words for what people say in the interviews. Keep to the script of what the person has said, right? Completely. Then I store the transcript off on and off the computer as stated in my ethics form. Um, you have to, as I said, stick to the ethics form, you know, secured folder, etc. etc. Then I arrange the scripts into developed themes, and that's how I managed to pick out a lot of stuff and categorize them in themes. I made it a lot easier to um to conduct um my findings and uh, through my research. When you find that golden thread in the themes, it makes it a lot better, a lot better. You don't just click up through, oh, that looks nice, oh, that sounds great. Where does it stick to? Where, where does that person, what that person said go? You sort of mean, have your theme set up when you start reading it. Have that in your head, what you're going to do, strategize it. So that's the best thing for you to do. So yes, aim for the milestones. If the lecturers put milestones up for you, milestones one, two, three, however there are, they may change it year, year after year. But set your, set the, your own milestones and um, go for the milestones as well, what the lecturers have sent you, and submit them off on the milestones um, deadlines that you have. So they're not marked, it's just to keep you on track. And uh, once you do that, then you know, you know how, oh my gosh, I don't have enough time. If you kept to the milestones, you have no problem. During COVID, hello, I was doing my dissertation then. If I didn't stick to my milestones then, I would have been in deep problems right now. Like, you know, you know, there's some people that still haven't submitted their dissertation yet because co possibly didn't stick to the milestones. Thankfully, also you've got three months extra time, but sticking to the milestones make a big difference in getting the work done on time and without getting capped for 10% or 5% of how, how, how much it is. So let's keep, so let's keep on time. So yes, I showed gratitude to the setting, sent them an email, I said thank you. That's showing, you know, that positive relationship that you are grateful that they actually set, gave your setting um, to you to use. Once you do that, you never know in the future where something may, may hold. You want to go back to that same setting. They're like, yes, yes, welcome. You know, you know, thank, thank you for, for, allowing, for choosing us to do your setting. And, and I say thank you for allowing me to, 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 to use your setting. Have that positive relationship with them. They don't, they don't owe you the setting. They're doing you a big favor, you know attended every single workshop there is, attended every single supervision session there is. It's important. Even times when I was the only one that turned up, don't turn up for, the, for your friend. Don't turn up because my friend is going. Or when, if you go into the room, you see it's empty, walk out again. That's the perfect time for you to have a one-to-one -one session with your supervisor, tailored, independent to your dissertation. I got a problem, could you help me? No one's around. I got all the, the whole hour to myself. Why would I turn up? You see what I mean? Especially if your work is so unique, like what I had, what my, my one was, it was perfect. No problems. Go to your super, supervisor and get the work done. It's not when things get tough, that's when you start complaining, I don't have any help, and you have a supervisor there and you never turned up. So it's best to go to your supervisor. That's what they're there for. Main important thing, keep positive. It was hard to do, but I kept myself positive. I still have issues keeping myself positive, but at that time when I needed to, I kept myself positive. I remained focused. I dug deep. There's a lot of soul searching in, in doing your dissertation. I'm telling you, when you feel like you're a failure, when you feel like you can't do anything, or you're not smart enough to do it, there's a lot of negative vibes and on all that going on in you. You have to dig deep. And that's what I've done. I dug so deep and I managed to come out. I believed in myself. And most importantly, I prayed. I'm not ashamed to say that. I prayed every single day to make sure that the ethics, the one thing I was worried about, especially that the ethics was kept, you know, making sure that nobody can say to me, I'm sorry, Antonia, but you didn't do this or you missed that out. So hmm, that's what I, I did. And guess what happened? 
the There you have it. So I got 70%. And um, yeah, if you want to know more about how I've done it, you know you can always contact me. And um, I hope you enjoyed this, this, you know, impromptu lecture. And um, see you soon. That was so nice. Oh, the head result. You see the head result. Hard work do pay, you know. Yeah. All the hard work. <laughs> <laughs>